Gotta love the Bavarian U-Bahn, the Ram Stiegel Mayerplatz rides us out on another adventure. Today's day seven. I've got up quite early this morning, as you can see. It's misty, and today I'm heading down to the Nymphenburg Palace. It's an old Baroque palace from the days of the electors of Bavaria. The electors of Bavaria were a college of around nine princes who selected who was the head of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, in the Middle Ages until about the 1800s. And this palace belonged to one of them, um, one of the electors of Bavaria, who eventually became the King of Bavaria after an alliance with the French. And you can see from the scale of this place, it's absolutely massive. Extensive waterworks, a very wide front. I think it's even wider than the Palace of Versailles. Let's get a little closer. Yeah, you can really see the French influence here. Here you have the main hall, designed by a French architect. The roof has a picture of Helios, the sun god, in his chariot. It's very uh, ostentatious in style, as are most of the other rooms within the house. The lady over there um, managed to become relatively independent and invested a lot in real estate. She's one of the successful members of the family. Here I am in the Grand Gallery and you can see various pictures of how the house looked back in the day. In the corner, over here, you can see that room just ahead it actually has decorations in a Chinese style on the walls, which was very fashionable at the time. There's a demand for china plates and so on in Europe, and fine china work. Yeah, you can see the decorations just there. Now I'm back walking down the Grand Gallery and if you've seen um, similar palaces of the period, like the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, uh, you'll be familiar with this sort of layout. Here we've got a room I quite like. It was the Prince Elector's study. I quite like the gold borders here. I spent quite a bit of time in here looking around. They remind me a bit of a, um, some of the decorative work of the Vienna Secession, which was a group of artists in Vienna at the turn of the century. This is the Queen's rooms, you can see slightly uh, m more decorative, and here you have the bedroom where Ludwig II, the last king of Bavaria, was actually born. He was responsible for making the famous Disney castle, which you see in, um, in the film Schwanstein. Now I'm back at the entrance, one last look at this glorious Baroque ceiling, slightly too over the top for my taste, but um, it's been a a good visit inside the building and I'm going to head out into the grounds. As soon as you exit the main palace you come into a French style garden which is a broad boulevard flanked by a Greek inspired statuary and utopia with evidence of the presence of human order. In the distance you can see that there's a fountain or a large water feature. It's turned off at the minute because they don't want the water to freeze and damage the feature in the cold winters of Munich.
Because uh, now in the gardens of the Schloss Nymphenberg, um, I didn't think that much of the palace itself. I thought it was very French and very Rococo, but out here in the grounds, you can really see um, what they were trying to create, a building of order in a place of natural beauty. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Here I'm heading further into the English inspired landscape gardens. These were created in the early 1800s and you can hear the war of the waterfall from the distance. The gardens are dotted with small buildings such as these. And this one here, the family's bathing house on the shores of one of the two great lakes. The mist rising off the lake and the morning light is magical. It's almost as if it was a scene from Arthurian legend. Throughout the grounds there are a few beaches. For example over here you have what's been dubbed the Temple to Apollo which is a, a Greek influence style folly. Inside it has a painted reef and you can imagine in the summer the royal family perhaps picking, picnicking here on the banks of the lake in the glorious sunshine. Now it's time to head back towards the main building and leave behind the Schloss Nymphenburg. Just let's get one last shot of the glorious landscape gardens in the background. It's the trees, the colour, fire. And that's it. Farewell to one of the largest palaces, palace grounds in Europe. Okay, so I'm heading through central Munich now, on my way to one of my favourite museums in the city. And here we are in the Königsplatz or King Square to look at the Munich Glitz attack. There's effectively two museums here, one on the left which you can't see just yet is the Sculpture Museum and on the right you've got the Antiques Museum. In the centre you have this Greek inspired pediment structure which was built by Ludwig I, one of the first kings of Bavaria. The Bavarian Prince Alexis had cut a deal with Napoleon to gain some land um, in return for their loyalty and this elevated them from mere Prince Alexis to kings and some of this building could be seen as a way of Ludwig I saying he had arrived and he had as much taste classical architecture, classical sculpture, as any other man in Europe. Here we are in the Club's Tech, there's a chorus out of the antique art. Quite simple and not that interesting. And here at the other end of the scale we've got the Barberini form, one of the most ornate Hellenistic sculptures in this wonderful day. Here is Athena looking down, similar to the one we've seen in the Louvre. And here is the rest of the Greek gallery. There's a few fragments. They might look similar to ones you've seen before. Here is a Athenian funerary monument, I think. Similar to a modern gravestone. And here we have a statue of irony or peace with Plutus, a child, which is well. And this was erected by the Athenians as a way of symbolizing how their peace led to great wealth. Here is another 
Greek statue. And here we've got another shot a bit closer up of the Heracles and the child that I showed before, or perhaps this is Silas with Dionysius. Here we have the temple pediment of Aegina, and this is the older part of the pediment in the classical Greek style. Here you can see on the other side a much more um, athletic and dynamic style where the Greeks are moving and this temple is famous because both the pediment shape the transition from a relatively stilted classical chorus influence style to the dynamic Greek style which was so influential on Rome and the rest of the Hellenistic world. Here we have a Roman sarcophagus. Not sure exactly what's on this side, but on the other side it looks like a procession to perhaps sacrifice a bull on the altar. Here's a Roman mosaic representing the god of time or eternity, Aeon, which is suitable for this room, which shows statues of the Roman Empress throughout the ages. Here you have Augustus, the first emperor. And over here, Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor, recognisable by his big bushy beard. One of the rougher soldier emperors, perhaps Caracalla, from later in the empire's history. And finally, towards the very end of the empire, one of the Constantinian emperors by the look of it. Here we have a statue of Apollo. It's got eyeliner on. At first I thought it was a woman, but the label says Apollo, so we'll go with that. All under this glorious dome inspired by the Pantheon in Rome. Now I'm in the antique museum where we have a lot of Greek pottery, large amounts of this glazed red and black earthenware style here. Some of the more unusual white style shown just before. Most of it is this solid terracotta pieces. And here is one of the more impressive and large examples of the style. This is an ionic column found in the basement. It's very ornate, it might have been part of a temple at some point. Now the glassware from the Roman period. Glass was quite a rare commodity in antiquity, so it's an unusual collection. Here we have some Greek metalwork, including the famous Corinthian helmet. And finally, a large bronze jug to round off the normal metalwork section before the jewellery section. Here we have a leaf crown in gold, one of the best pieces in my opinion in the antique museum. An incredible level of craftsmanship to make leaves so fine. And here we have a more traditional golden diadem symbol of kingship in the Hellenistic world. Here we have some gold Roman jewellery. And that's the end of my time in the club to tech. Kudinski and the Blue Rider group produce some of their works. I'm gonna have a look inside. Just to be clear, the Blue Rider group produced their work in Munich, not in this museum itself. The museum was set up by a famous painter who 
was rich enough to build a house and after the war it became a refuge for many avant-garde works like these pieces by the Blue Rider group. You can see that there's a lot of bright simple colours and the painters included um, those such as Kodinsky and Maka. This is one of my favourite pieces by Maka, Zoological Gardens. The Blue Rider group were very influenced by childlike paintings. And also by music. Here we have one of Kodinsky's improvisations. And here's another inspired by the atonal music of Arthur Schoenberg. You can see the black of the piano, the white columns of the music hall and the transcendental yellow meant to represent the power of music washing over the listeners. Here we have a semi-cubist influenced tiger, very striking image. And here are a few more in the gallery. We've got the picture by Franz Mack known as the Blue Horse coming up in a couple of seconds. There you go, there's the Blue Horse. It's one of the most famous pieces by the Blue Rider Group. Finally, this is one of Kodinsky's um, paintings again. I really like the colours. There's so much contrast between the blues and the reds. This now is in the basement. Here's some art from Sudan. It's a slightly unusual collection they have down here. Interesting Arabic calligraphy. And here we have some of the 19th century German painting. Very unusual impressionistic style of flowers. Technically skilled painters. Much more so than Kedinsky or any of the Blue Rider group. This one's by Franz Struck of The Wild Hunt. And you've got great emotion on the faces of the riders. And here we have a garden. And another 19th century landscape. This is a work by Kadinsky's girlfriend and from trees in, in his early period and this is one by Kadinsky himself. You can see the bright colours are just starting to break through. Finally, here's the rooms of Lembach, the painter who founded the museum in the first place. A very traditional German style, heavy medieval influence in his choice of decor for these rooms. While outside you have a garden filled with modern sculptures and I really like the contrast here between the old and the new. You've got these modern pieces set within the shadow of one of the most famous classical museums in Europe. And you can see over there the Glyptotech in the distance. A really beautiful space to see and my day.